Good, good evening, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? So when the Vermont Humanities Council announced that a special Ken Burns event was scheduled for April, and we had to postpone Nick Mueller's talk on Frank Lloyd Wright, um, I received several questions about uh, when Mr. Mueller was going to be able to speak. Luckily, his schedule was open for June, so we have him, have him tonight. So this is our last first Wednesday of the season. Uh, before I introduce Nick, I just want to thank all of you who have attended our first Wednesday lectures since October 2013. Uh, these lectures brought to you uh, Rumi, A Soul on Fire, to Whitey Bulger, whose soul is on fire. <laughs> we got to hear the amazing illustrator David McCauley talk about working in his uh, studio. And we went uh, from Amherst College, Professor Nicola de Courtright's talk on 16th and 17th century French kings in creating a royal French capital, Paris as we know it, to Dartmouth labor historian Annalise Orlick's account of African American Union maids in 1970 Las Vegas in What If the Poor Women Ran the World. Ignaz Solzhenitsyn was here in April and told us about his growing up in Cavendish, Vermont, and about his father, Alexander, writing his great work, The Red Wheel, here in Vermont. And just last month, we uh, listened to uh, Pulitzer Prize author Thomas Powers talk about soft versus hard power in American foreign policy. So we've had a really diverse year, and next year, I'm sure, will be just as diverse and, and interesting. So the, uh, the, the funding for these uh, programs uh, is done through our uh, Friends of the Library. Um, they uh, partially fund uh, the, uh, the program and many other things. And you'll, uh, after, after tonight, we'll have lots of racks of books uh, set up uh, for the uh, Strolling of the Heifer book sale, which will be uh, this Friday and Saturday. So I hope you drop by then and uh, spend some of your hard-earned cash on some uh, old-fashioned books. So the Friends of the Library uh, does not do this alone, uh, the first Wednesday sponsorship. We have other uh, funders from the area. Um, they are Brattleboro Savings and Loan, the Vermont Country Store, Downs La Rackland Martin, New Chapter, and the Vermont Department of Libraries. Why don't we just give them a big hand? Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, now, uh, now on to our speaker. H. Nicholas Mueller III is retired executive director of the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation. A historian, Mr. Mueller also served as an executive director of the Wisconsin Historical Society. He is past president of Colby Sawyer College in New Hampshire and a former dean of arts and science at the University of Vermont. He is a co-editor of a recent book of 19 essays on Vermont entitled The Vermont Difference, Perspectives from the Green Mountain State, which takes a nuanced look at the best of Vermont. It was published in the spring by the Woodstock Foundation of the Vermont Historical Society. And the other editors include uh, J. Kevin Graffinino, H. David Donath, and Christian Peterson Ishak, who have worked together on Vermont topics and projects with, uh, with Nicholas since uh, the 1970s. Uh, he also has another book that I had forgotten about, and it's a book on Ethan Allen. And um, that just came out. Yes, <laughs> It'll be for sale in the bookstores, and uh, we're getting a copy from the library, of course. So, but tonight we're going to hear about Frank Lloyd Wright, so please welcome H. Nicholas Mueller. I have to remember to wire up here. On. Hey, I think, I think it's working. You know, um, I didn't know Whitey Bulger had a soul. <laughs> and after reading the list of folks who have preceded me here this year, it reminds me of a story about the Johnstown flood. And uh, a guy before David McCullough had spent most of a lifetime learning about that flood. And he left the temporal world, and uh, when he got to the pearly gates, St. Peter said, you're okay. Okay, and how do we turn this thing on? What do we said? Yeah, well, let's make this one move and, uh, while I tell him about St. Peter. <laughs> and he said, I've spent my entire life uh, 
talking about, reading about, writing about the Johnstown flood. Uh, is there a place for me to talk here in heaven? He said, yeah, not only is there a place, we've got the big theater ready to go. You're in the marquee and you're on day after tomorrow. Oh. So he boned up a little and he went down, and got on the stage, got ready to talk after the introduction. He looked out in the audience, audience and who's sitting there but Noah. <laughs> There are people going to be here tonight, uh, like Barbara Guerrero, who probably know more about Frank Lloyd Wright than I do. Uh, recent visitors to uh, Falling Water may know some things I don't know either. Uh, in uh, true confessions, I am a historian who got sidetracked being an administrator. I, I like to eat more and you know, drive better things. I mean, they were paying faculty members. But also, I'm not an architect. I have two sons who are architects. But I don't talk architect language. There's their own language. And, uh, you know, I also drink a lot of wine, but I can't talk, you know, wine people's language either. About, like Robert Parker, there's, you know, this thing is a foxy little thing with hints of oak. And... <laughs> so I may not uh, quite satisfy you here, but let's give this a try. <laughs> This is the famous presentation drawing that was given to Ed Kaufman in early, uh, really September 22nd, uh, 1935. Kaufman, uh, the drawing was not by Frank Lloyd Wright, it was by Jack Howe, one of the apprentices. Many of, uh, of he had apprentices, Jack Howe was a person who, who did a lot of his work, Davy Davison did the night uh, kinds of things. They understood his vocabulary. They could really mimic, frankly, Wright's drawing. It was his ideas, but and there is falling water. I went to the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation in 1966. Uh, I could tell they were in trouble, and uh, I'd spent sort of a lifetime bailing out institutions that had had some trouble. And when I got there, uh, I began to hear the story of, of falling water. <clears throat> this was a building the American Institute of Architecture took a poll of, their, of 800 of their members in 1978. Uh, it was rated the fourth most important building uh, in the United States. And in 1991, a similar poll put it at the top. So it is an important building. But what I learned was that Edgar Kaufman Jr. had come to the Taliesin Fellowship, and I'll talk a little about that. And that uh, because of that, he got to know Mr. Wright, and he introduced Mr. Wright to his father, Edgar J. Kaufman, uh, who owned the Kaufman Department Store in Pittsburgh. And that uh, E.J., as Frank Lloyd Wright called him, uh, commissioned him Brought him in December of 1934 right to Bear Run or Mill Valley or whatever it was called and commissioned him to build a, a place uh, there. And Wright accepted the commission but didn't do anything. This is the story that if you're with the fellowship or other places. And he didn't do anything and E.J. was in Milwaukee and made a call and said he was going to be at Spring Green in a day or two. And Mr. Wright, the word they used, simply shook the building out of his sleeve. <laughs> and they prepared this presentation drawing and a number of other drawings to show E.J. The commission came because of Edgar Kaufman, Jr. Frank Lloyd Wright shook it out of his pocket, or his sleeve. The construction of falling water in the I, in, the, in the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation, and, and in, frankly, most of the literature, uh, demonstrated that Frank Lloyd Wright's understanding of engineering was absolutely as good as his understanding of design. That he could design these cantilevers, and uh, they were imposing. And not only that, but when people questioned him, he went out and stood under them when they still had the braces under it. And with his own sledgehammer, 
whacked him off so that this would, you know, and demonstrated he had the courage that his engineering was going to be good. Uh, the only time I know he did anything like that was uh, building the uh, Johnson Wax Building, uh, which the commission followed this hard on, hard on it, and it was really very close. When he designed those uh, uh, lily pad uh, columns, I, I think, frankly, it looked, looked more, much more like an, uh, an intake valve in an you know, engine than they do a lily pad. But, and that the Wisconsin commissioners, uh, building commissioners, wouldn't let them build them because obviously they couldn't hold the loads. And so he had one fabricated and had it put up and guyed up, and then they got a crane and they just kept lifting bags of, of concrete on it until they got three times the load that it was supposed to take. And uh, then he went out with his pork pie hat and his cape and his, you know, and stood under it. I actually did that. And finally, the fourth part of this is that Falling Water was a, a, an immediate worldwide and national success, recognized literally worldwide. So what's going on with this building? In 19, from 1927 to 1932, Frank Lloyd Wright had started, it's hell on gestures, you know. <laughs> Frank Lloyd Wright had started out uh, in the Prairie School, and, and this is the Roby House, Most many of you have seen it in Chicago, but it emphasizes those long uh, horizontal structures sitting in the prairie, that's the, uh, a, a deck that is here, and it actually had a steel beam holding it. Uh, in 1924, he met Mrs. Wright. She was half of his age. He was married to Miriam Noel at the time. He had been married to Catherine before that, but he, of course, absconded uh, with uh, Mrs. Cheney. Miriam Borthwick Cheney, and uh, he had had a rough marital life. <laughs> when he met Oglavana, uh, was in the theater in Chicago, and they really immediately got along, and, and I think she was very important for the rest of his life. At the time, she was married and, and uh, had a daughter, uh, and then they had a daughter, and then uh, uh, Miriam Noel, uh, sued him for alienation and affection and set the feds after him for violating the Mann Act. And uh, he and uh, Ogilvana went into hiding in Minnesota, but can you imagine Frank Lloyd Wright going into hiding? I mean, he was always flamboyant. So they were immediately caught, but the situation was smoothed over. He eventually got a divorce and they got married in 1928. But he had no work. He had five commissions and one built building between 27, 28, and, and 32. In 1932, he was 65 years of age. The last major building he had done was the Imperial Hotel. That's Edgar and Edgar Jr. And this is part of the myth, and Frank Lloyd Wright. And there's where he stood under, presumably, and kicked out the, the braces, and, and it stood. And this is the instant recognition of uh, how good Taliesin was, his, the only architect to that point to ever appear on the cover of Time. And that is Frank Clark Wright, the young architect who did Roby House, and I think the best building of that period is the Larkin Building in 1903 in Buffalo. And the interior is really critical to this. Now, the mayor of Buffalo had it torn down some years ago to put a parking lot in. But the, the, those things happen. And, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was a prairie architect, but he got himself into trouble uh, for being socially uh, undesirable. And the last big commission he did, that was one of his prairie homes. Uh, that's the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo. Uh, which uh, he finished in 1922. There was a big earthquake there in 1924, and it survived the earthquake. And he made sure everybody in the United States and the rest of the world knew it, too. <laughs> so, 
in Madison, <laughs> in Spring Green, Wisconsin. Poor. Letters show Mrs. Wright wrote about uh, having to tear up tablecloths to make clothing. Uh, of course, he was also driving a, a cord automobile. Uh, don't ask for consistency. That was a 19, the store house in 1920, excuse me, the Ennis house in 1924. Those were his last commissions. And he had begun to build Taliesin in 1912. He built it. May Ma Cheney moved into it with her two kids. He would come from Chicago on weekends until the Barbadian houseboy rolled up carpets, soaked them with gasoline, pushed them up against the door, lit them, and murdered all three of them as they tried to escape and five of the seven workmen who were also having lunch in a separate place. Uh, the building burned. He rebuilt it. It's Taliesin II. And that burned again in, I think, 1926. And the third Taliesin is where he brought uh, Oglavana in 1924. <clears throat> this is uh, the interior of Taliesin II. Just, to, uh, just trying to give you a sense. She pushed him uh, not to quit. She pushed him to write, and he produced in 1932 his autobiography. He was writing for magazines. Uh, he was saying really nasty things about the University of Wisconsin and about academia in general, where he'd gone from one term. Uh, and uh, he, he had a pretty piercing uh, way to put things. And then, of course, as the Depression uh, spreads, uh, they decided they ought to have a, a School of Allied Arts at Taliesin and to link it with the University of Wisconsin. Well, that wasn't going to go very far because after some things he'd said about the university. So in 1932, shortly after this book appeared, they produced a mimeographed 16-page um, prospectus for their school and sent it to all their best friends, like. George the Fifth and uh, <coughs> Buckminster Fuller, and they offered to young people the opportunity to come to Taliesin and to work with Mr. Wright and Mrs. Wright, though she was muted in this. Uh, and all they had to pay was six hundred and some dollars a year tuition. Twenty-three people showed up, young people. Some of them very good. They had come from places and not finished their degrees, like Vassar and Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and what it was Carnegie Tech then, is now Carnegie Mellon. Uh, these were young, bright people who had been told as they grew up that if they worked hard, produced in school, there was a future for them. And they had worked hard, and they'd seen their friends graduate and find themselves unable to find work in Depression America. And I think it, these were not poor folks, but these were folks who wanted to matter. In most cases had read his autobiography and talked about it, uh, were inspired and came to Taliesin. There's a group in 1934 uh, in front of the, his studio was there, in the, and uh, that's Ivana, their daughter, and their dog Wolf, and uh, Ogovana sitting beside their daughter. And what they did, Frank Lloyd Wright went out and designed the studio there, which I didn't put up. Uh, that's Mr. Kaufman. We'll come back to him. And um, taught them how to take wood, cure it, saw it into dimension lumber, how to quarry the limestone in the Wisconsin River Valley, how to make, uh, not concrete, but the, the, help me here, the mortar. Uh, out of the, uh, essentially by burning the limestone of that valley, the same limestone that's on the walls there. 
and they built uh, this studio, which is now on the National Register of Historic Places. It's a fantastic place. They took care of livestock. They planted the fields. They cooked. They sewed. Uh, some of them didn't like this and left. Others, uh, some are still extant and, st and still moving back and forth between Talias and West and Talias and East, although they're leaving us at, at an alarming rate. One of the, um, these 23 arrive, and that, then others come. While this is going on, this is Edgar, Edgar Kaufman, senior, in 1929. Uh, his background uh, was one of wealth, marketing, interest in design, philandering, and uh, <laughs> that's a polite word for it. And also, uh, feeling very much that conservative Pittsburgh really didn't have much place for Jewish leadership. He had uh, discovered Bear Run in 1909, the same year he married his cousin, Lillian. He took control of the family department store in 1910. He rented uh, land on Bear Run uh, for recreational things for the employees of his department store. Then he bought 1,600 acres there. He tried to get uh, the Civilian Conservation Corps to take responsibility for it. They re refused. Um, his son, Edgar Kaufman Jr., was born in 1910 uh, and lived a very privileged life. And in 19, there's EJ in, in uh, 1940, bent over design, but you can see the design behind him. That's part of the office that Frank Lloyd Wright designed for him in Coffin's department store. That's his wife. She was also philandering. And there's <laughs> why she had that portrait painted, nobody knows. But that was the portrait she had painted. It was done in Italy. There's Ed Edgar uh, with his mistress. And, uh, Grace Stoops. You're going to hear me say that Edgar Kaufman Jr. Uh, related in, in his writing that he had been in Europe and came home in 1934 because money was tight. In 1934, Edgar Kaufman brought her a quarter of a million dollars worth of jewelry. Money was not tight. That's the Kaufman family, Lillian. <laughs> E.J. and E.J. Jr. Let's get that one off of there. There's Mr. Kaufman in the bedroom uh, at uh, Falling Water. And that's Kaufman's department store. That's about a 1905. It got expanded several times since then. It's on the corner of Fifth Avenue and Diamond Street in Pittsburgh. So Frank Lloyd Wright and Edgar Kaufman get together. E.J. tells us, after both Mr. Wright and his father are dead, that he had come back because money was tight. And he came to New York. And a woman introduced him to Frank Lloyd Wright's autobiography. He was captivated by it. And found a way to meet Mr. Wright and join the fellowship in 1934. In fact, money was not tight. He never would name this mysterious person who gave him a copy of the autobiography. His father provided his introduction to Mr. Wright. And he went to the fellowship in 34, and he had a very short stay there. Brendan Gill, who wrote the biography of Wright called Many Masks, a former editor, now long gone, of The New Yorker, about whom it was often said, if you want to keep your reputation intact, outlive Brendan Gill. <laughs> because he wrote, his, he wrote his, his work about people after they were no longer in a position to defend themselves. <laughs> uh, 
Gill says that Edgar Kaufman was asked to leave Taliesin for homosexual activities. And he was a homosexual, I mean, that, at least later in life. I have no idea what he was like at that period. He was 24 years old uh, at that time. So the story that Edgar J. Kaufman Jr. was responsible for introducing his father to Mr. Wright, and therefore falling water resulted, doesn't hold up. Because uh, a couple of things that uh, Kaufman had done with Mr. Wright, one of them was Broad Acre City. It still exists. Uh, you can see it at Taliesin in Spring Green, Wisconsin, but it's frequently on the road and it and exhibits. It's about 10, 10 feet square. And it's a model, there it is up on end. It, it, it looks like a stone wall there, but what it really is is a, is a scale model of a city. Showing, it's got everything from ballparks to railroad stations to uh, open lands to dense housing to separated housing. And uh, when they finished it, Cornelia Brierly, who just passed on last year, took it to the Kaufman's department store where it was put on exhibit and she was there talking about this. She was one of the, the group uh, who were, those are the apprentices uh, in um, Chandler, Arizona, Arizona before they, they built Taliesin West. And this was, this thing uh, is probably the reason that Mr. Wright met Henry Luce. Uh, this was exhibited in New York, and we think that that's where Frank Lloyd Wright met Henry Luce and his wife, Claire Luce, Claire Booth Luce, and, and that, that's one of the reasons I'm going to talk a little bit why this thing got off to such a huge falling water roaring start, because Henry Luce had started Time in 1930, started Fortune, Life Magazine, The Architectural Record. Those were all his. And uh, he was not, he understood how to promote things. Frank Lloyd Wright was one of the most shameful promoters uh, of himself. And uh, Edgar Kaufman also knew how to market. So it's not surprising at all that uh, Falling Water, uh, when it finally was inhabited in 1937, uh, had a huge, uh, I'll call it a rollout. Uh -huh. This was a project that he designed for Pittsburgh uh, at Mr. Kaufman's urging. That's where the, I guess I can do that, where the Mahong Monongahela and the Allegheny River form the Ohio. It's called Point Park Civic Center. Uh, it was to house uh, city government, Allegheny County government, uh, and other functions, even uh, some transportation now. In 1996, uh, the Monona Terrace project that he had developed for Madison, Wisconsin in the late 30s, and then had brought it back in the 50s, uh, he, was, he had some detractors there in Wisconsin, and particularly in the legislature, who pushed through some legislation that made it impossible to build it. But eventually, in 1996, it opened. It's now a convention center instead of a civic center. But in Madison, two blocks from the Capitol, that was going to house Dane County government, Madison city government, uh, buses, railroad go through there. Uh, and that's the same concept he had here uh, for Pittsburgh. That's uh, one of the night renderings. I thought you might like that. That is of the same project. Uh, that's Davy Davidson's handwork. It's really, uh, I think, quite an extraordinary drawing. But this was uh, this was not something that E.J. Jr. Had, had brought about. That's the design for the garage at Kauf Kaufman's department store. I just stop for a second. And, uh, I'm going to say, well, I know it's in the mid '30s. And I'm not going to say because I could be wrong by a year and then 
Somebody know out here is going to tell me. You can see you know, the, those early, I, I really didn't want to spend much time on the prairie school here. I wanted to concentrate on falling water. But you can see what the change in vocabulary this man had from his early work right through the Imperial Hotel and that a cement blockhouse for Mr. Ennis in Los Angeles. How does a man more than 65 years old reinvent his vocabulary? Why? Is it Mrs. Wright, the fellowship? Is it his anger with the uh, Bauhaus and Gropius? Is it his anger with uh, MoMA doing their show on modern architecture in 1931 that excluded him? Except that somebody, uh, there was a little political influence and they gave him a very minor place in it. But it was all the uh, European, mostly the European architecture. So I just ask you to look at that. Nobody, to my knowledge, scholars, and, and I'm hardly an architectural scholar, has answered very well the question about why did a 65-year-old man, he was 68 when he started to do the presentation drawing for Falling Water. What happened? It's, it's, it's extraordinary. Uh, across the uh, Monongahela River, or pretty much across from the point itself, uh, on the uh, hillside there called Mount Washington in Pittsburgh, where the incline is that goes from the top to the bottom, from Carson Street up to the top of the hill, uh, he designed this uh, residential project. So there it is. You get to see it at another angle. These are all things that he designed for Pittsburgh. None of them built. Uh, but Edgar Kaufman Jr. had a real sense of style and design. He had built earlier in his life uh, two houses in Pittsburgh that were very classical. He had three houses in Pittsburgh, two in Squirrel Hill, and one he built in Fox Chapel after that. Uh, and then he built this uh, falling water. Come back maybe to a sense of uh, being Jewish and the exclusion that he felt in Pittsburgh. Two of his houses were in a district called Squirrel Hill, which was inhabited really by the more wealthy Jewish people. And most of Pittsburgh's wealth had a, a weekend or summer retreat in a town called Ligonier. That's where the Mellons had a place, and that's where the Heinzes had a place. But there really wasn't much place for him, so he was close by in Bear Run, which wasn't a town, but it's called Parallel Run now. And uh, yeah, I have a sense that this, this plays a role in it, and he really did have a good sense of design. Another piece of evidence there, and I, I didn't put a slide in here for you, is that he built a major house in Palm Springs in California. But he'd moved on from Wright, and he hired, and it was designed by Richard Neutra. So here's a man who had done classical stuff for his Pittsburgh houses. Frank Lloyd Wright designs for Pittsburgh and Falling Water, and then moved on. I think he's very familiar with design, but I, isn't that what a merchant prince does? Is understand the trends of the time and provide uh, for the market. So this is the merchant prince, I call him, and the design. That's uh, the falls, and that is an early picture. Those are Kaufman department store employees enjoying a little outing. The book I scanned, I couldn't get straight in the scanner, so it, you know, it's, it's a little cockeyed, but you get the point. And I just wanted you to see the, the landscape there. In 1934, in December, Wright visits the site. In 1935, on September 22nd, Wright rolls out the presentation drawings to Edgar, Edgar Kaufman. He then sends a, a, a set to him. Kaufman writes back to him and uh, 
wants working drawings as quickly as he can, and he refers to the various elements of working drawings like he really knew architecture, and I think he did. There were seven sets of working drawings uh, for falling water, uh, one of which uh, Wright sent to an engineering firm, in, excuse me, Kaufman sent to an engineering firm uh, in Pittsburgh, uh, the Knowles firm. Kaufman had a degree from Yale in engineering, which also tells you something. And he was worried about the site and the design, both. The Knowles report, they hadn't really seen working drawings, but they, they went out and did a lot of work around and said that a stream won't stay that way forever. There's erosion. It would have to be strong enough to hold the flotsam and jetsam and logs and things that came down and banged. And anybody that lives in Vermont knows uh, what a storm like Irene can do and how it can tear up things by itself. But in the objects, it moves against bridges and things. It's serious. And they pointed out these issues. Also, I took issue with uh, where Wright wanted to put it on these uh, major rocks. Kaufman. Uh, nevertheless was not daunted by this, but understood that there were some issues about which he and a builder would have to deal. The first builder turned out to be, uh, have a little drunk problem and he was sent on his way. So the construction begins in 1936. There's a section drawing of it, just to let you see what that looks like. The drawings that, was, that Wright was producing were really being done mostly by his fellows, the men in the fellowship. Jack Howe, Edgar Tavel, a well-known architect. Davy Davison, uh, Wes Peters. After a while, uh, Wes had been banished from Taliesin because Wes uh, uh, had married his stepdaughter Svetlana Oglavana's daughter by her first marriage and they didn't approve of that and they were banished for a year but they came back. Uh, Wes was a man bigger than life. Uh, he was the son of uh, the newspaper pe people in Evansville, uh, Indiana. He knew how to spend money and did. Uh, by the time I knew him he didn't have much to spend. But he did have two gull-wing Mercedes at the same time, and, and he was always buying elaborate gifts for uh, his fellows in the fellowship. Uh, I really liked the man uh, immensely. He was a well, So there's uh, the first, and they, they, were, they started building this uh, before they had all the drawings. The construction people got ahead of the, of, of the, of the drawings at one point. Uh, Abe Dunbar was a fellow who was sent there. He didn't have the, the technical skills, really. He later uh, said that uh, he never could get his architectural license in Ohio because he didn't really have the technical skills he could draw. And Abe was taken away, and Bob Mosher was the apprentice that did most of the work there. Uh, Mosher was there between uh, the two contractors and did over, supervise a lot of it himself. I'm groping for a word, uh, the, the forms on which this sit, uh, I think it was cradles, but there's an architectural word and I'll probably think of it at about 10 o'clock tonight somewhere north of Springfield. Um, Mosher was uh, directing this and they were doing these, the pillars that the building rate rests on Designed. There were four of them. They were designed in, in rectangular form, and uh, Wright didn't like that. Uh, he thought one of them was a way visually, and designed them in a V shape, in a V shape. Uh, and Mosher had to take down the first of these, first group of three, and build the others. And at that point, he knew he was over his head, and they hired a builder from Allegheny. It's a Pennsylvania town. It's got a second word in it. Uh, Allegheny, something or other. Pennsylvania, about three hours away. And he was excellent. 
And so that really helped the situation. There are some of the uh, workmen. While this was going on, the stone for this was all quarried locally. Um, Kaufman wrote to Wright, you know, how do you want this done? And Wright essentially said, anything that's four inches or less thick, I want you to put one place, going to use that for the floor. But otherwise, make sure it's at least a foot wide, uh, so you've got another architectural form uh, term so that these stones are held together by almost like keystones on a, on a, on a tunnel top. Or and so they, they quarried a lot of stone. You can still find the quarry there. Put that in just so you can see the power of Bear Run. I, I've been there a couple of times. I, I was there, happened to be there in a drought once, and there wasn't a, even a trickle. Um, but that's a powerful cascade. There it is beginning to take shape from the east. And again. Pretty nice uh, structure, isn't it? Now those cantilevers, the engineers and Kaufman understood there were some problems with them. And Mosher and the builder and Kaufman surreptitiously put a lot more steel in them than Wright had called for. That wouldn't be the first time. You can read Edgar Tapple's book, and he had, uh, was it, the apprentices were used sort of like construction managers. If you're building a house, you have a construction manager or somebody to oversee it. If, if it's a larger building, you've got a construction manager who's, who's really responsible for having the contractors do what they're contracted to do, making sure they meet the specifications and uh, making sure that they don't cut corners. And that's what the apprentices really did for Mr. Wright's projects and for his clients. And Edgar talks a number of times about essentially where he's got cantilevers, a couple of them, one in Racine, Wisconsin, they, they put steel in it and didn't tell him. Uh, he had uh, mostly uh, would use small reinforcing steel and then um, wood. I, I must tell you, and you've just been there, I, mean, I love the building. It's, it's a fun place. Doesn't have a front door. It's an entryway. It's, that's it, taken from the living room. Uh, that was not untypical of Frank Lloyd Wright uh, trying to make his entryways, uh, particularly in the later period, the Usonian houses and things. He, he tries to provide a little bit of mystery and also likes you come in the entryway and suddenly have a building explode, visually. That's from the entryway looking at the living room. Almost all the furniture designed by Mr. Wright. There's a long list in the uh, Kaufman papers and also in the Frank Lane Wright archives. Another shot of the living room. You can see the stones on the floor, two to four inches in thickness. That's the dining area. One thing about Frank Lloyd Wright houses, uh, he did not think that bathrooms were places to sit in a whirlpool or to have seven mirrors and three vanities and uh, the other amenities of a 2014 bathroom, uh, which the square footage in houses now is you know, quite large. His were quite small. Uh, dining areas he liked to have distinct but integrated with living in the house. Kitchens. 
his kitchens were not large. And, uh, people, this is an aside, people who have bought Frank Lloyd Wright houses uh, and want to keep Frank Lloyd Wright, on the other hand, want it to meet their contemporary living, really have a bear of a time trying to figure out how to handle the kitchen and the bedroom, the bathrooms. They also have a bear of a time with his uh, radiant heating, which was done in iron pipes uh, in the concrete on most of the floors. Of course, the iron pipes, the stuff in the water going through them, uh, not to mention the regular oxidation. You buy a 70-year-old Frank Lloyd Wright house, somehow you gotta get the jackhammer the floor up and get the new radiant heating stuff in in plastic and get it back down. It's, it's extraordinary. That's the guest uh, room with its uh, desk and fireplace. So, somehow I messed that up too, but my first PowerPoint I ever made, I'm very proud, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> so it rolls out in 1937, in 1938, he's on the cover of Time. Architectural Record does a full issue to Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, Anne Rand, on Rand, writes to Fountainhead, and, you know, that's Howard Rourke, uh, who is so disturbed by what the politicians and the builders are doing to his building, he destroys it. But, uh, and she was a good friend of the Wrights. But that's an example of the, of the rollout in Life magazine. A MoMA exhibit on Frank Lloyd Wright. This greatest building in the world. And, and Mr. Henry Luce and E.J. Kaufman and Mr. Wright would tell them that. Although Wright really didn't do it as much as the others, because while this was happening in 37 and in 38, he was working on and finishing the Johnson Wax buildings. And the, the head of publicity for Johnson Wax uh, was not slow either. And they had that building in advertisements and they were also selling product with it, mop, the predecessor to Mop and Glow, <laughs> which is good stuff on Frank Lloyd Wright's floors. I, I lived with those for six years. Uh, the, four foot squares uh, in red, <laughs> Cherokee red, that in the desert attracted sand like a honey pot does ants <laughs> and dust. And so about every other Saturday I was out to scrub that and mop and glow it. And as, as pushed toward the end of this, uh, just thought you'd like to see Frank Lloyd Wright at a picnic with Oglavana. He's an older man by now, driving a carriage. She's driving. And that's about the time, him at about the time falling water was going up. As I close and then ask you if you want to pound any of you Noah's out there want to tell me what I don't know. Uh, fair enough. Uh, point I'm trying to make tonight is almost all of the literature on falling water uh, revolves around things that Edgar Kaufman Jr. wrote and not enough attention has been given to Edgar Kaufman Sr. who was obviously literate in design contemporary in design. That Frank Lloyd Wright did not shake this out of his sleeve in September of 1935. Even those presentation drawings, if you go in the archives and look at them, you can see erasure marks. They had been developing for a while. Probably started his real development in July 1935. Presentation drawings in September 22nd of 1935 and the first batch of working drawings uh, to Kaufman in Pittsburgh uh, in the spring of 1936. Kaufman was the year to get started. He did get started uh, almost immediately in 1936. 
as I told you, the construction got ahead of the plans at one point. So it, does it rate being the best architectural building in America? Arguably it does. Certainly, register, um, certainly in terms of, of homes, it does. It's an extraordinary building. Should have put another copy of the presentation drawing right after this. So my message to you is that it's time to get beyond the mythology. But the mythology doesn't in any way denigrate the power of this structure, the genius of this structure. And the fact that it was one of the first things he did after his fallow period, it launched him on a career where the Guggenheim, Monona Terrace, Johnson Wax, all the Usonian buildings, The opera house designed for Cairo, that, uh, or Baghdad, or both, actually, he tried to do them both places, that eventually became uh, the theater at Arizona State University uh, after his death. The Marin County Civic Center, the Price Tower in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. Literally hundreds of designs after he was 67 years old, and many of them completed. And today, some of them are still being completed. You can go buy Frank Lloyd Wright designs and drawings and pay a hell of a premium to the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation uh, and build his houses. Jerry, I'd like to thank uh, you and your staff for letting me talk tonight to a large group. It really is a great pleasure. I'm basically a Vermont historian, not an architectural historian. But I did have the privilege for six years to serve as president and CEO and president of the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation and take it out of financial straits, get its School of Architecture accredited, and uh, start managing a staff uh, so that pay was equitable and there was actually a, a handbook and all the kinds of things you'd like to do for a modern organization and build it in endowment. Uh, I'll tell you one more little story and then, then I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, a neighbor of yours up the road who was no longer with us, um, Archibald Cox, we brought him to uh, Wisconsin to talk to a large group. There was an auditorium that held a little over 300. It was almost packed. And Archie had a hearing problem. You may know that. And he talked. It was very effective. After he finished, I came and got a mic with him and said that, to the audience that he had some trouble hearing. And you don't have out there microphones and we don't have anybody running around with a boom. Uh, if you give me the question, uh, I'll repeat it for him. And, and I told him a story about it. We do have a microphone for the audience. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> there was a judge in northern Wisconsin. And in Wisconsin, you run for, your, for office to be a judge. You don't get appointed. And, uh, he was hard into politics and, and also hard into, they like brandy. Uh, uh, Brandy Manhattans, and beer, of course. And he was hard into that, and he was coming home most nights pretty schnockered. And his wife he finally had enough of it. Large lady with curlers and, you know, big robe. You can just picture it. And so one night, she told him when he came in, this was it. You either stop this behavior, or I'm leaving, and I'm going to clean you out on the way. And so he did. He got off the sauce for about 10 days. And he came in one night pretty well in trouble. And he reached for the light switch and hit the pots and pans. There was noise everywhere. And he went down in a heap on the floor. And the light went on. And she's standing here, you know, the, not really with a rolling pin, but you, <laughs> sort of with a rolling pin. 
And uh, she said, what do you have to say for yourself? He said, madam, I will take questions from the floor. <laughs> And, and with, all, with all due respect, we do have a microphone if anyone wishes to use it for their question. I hope there's due respect. <laughs> How livable was that house? Beg your pardon? How livable was that house? Well, I don't know. The question was how livable was the house? and. There are different stories about that. Uh, you know, it, it's hard for me, what I know, to make a pronouncement about that. Uh, because, number one, E.J. and Lillian were off doing their own thing a lot of the times. So it wasn't like it was always a friendly little family house. And then Edgar J. Jr. Uh, also had his quirks. And he would bring people there, uh, a lot of his friends, particularly his New York friends from MoMA, where he worked, the Metropolitan Museum of Modern Art. And um, they would have pretty good weekends there. My own experience living in a Frank Lloyd Wright designed house, uh, I found it very congenial. Very congenial. My wife did not. <laughs> So it, it's a, people that that live in them really like them. Comfortable. Beg your pardon? Comfortable. They, they, they are comfortable. Now, he'll tell you that he can't stand up in them. <laughs> because Mr. Wright thought that, you know, that he was just, a, he's out of proportion, I think was one of the things he said. You're just out of proportion. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara, you were going to say something. Yeah, um, I've heard that story about Frank Lloyd Wright shaking a that sign saying, out of his right? sleeve, but not necessarily uh, having to do with falling water. Did it ever happen to your knowledge, or he was making a drawing while someone was driving up the driveway? Well, that's what they say about falling water. Yeah. Not to my knowledge. Well, okay. No, I, I've heard that, so it's interesting that you... This is Barbara Guerrero, whose uh, father, Pedro, uh, was a good friend of both Mr. and Mrs. Wright and uh, was probably the most uh, able photographer to, to photograph not only buildings, structures, particularly Italians and West, but also uh, people, activities. Well, it's just flat out accurate. I was looking at your dad's uh, Talias and West uh, earlier this week. It's very good. And I'm no judge, so. <laughs> you said at some point, uh, other people that you know are going to hear you. Back they, there. they don't want to hear me, maybe. Really. No, I just wanted to know uh, how they could get away with claiming uh, the people that made these houses from the plants when they, when they put more structure into them, more. Um, Girders and stuff. They didn't talk. They didn't talk. But they didn't talk till later. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, Edgar, Edgar, Edgar Tapple didn't say that to Mr. Wright. Mr. Wright died in 1959 in April. Edgar only left us, I think, two years ago. And, uh, and how would it actually have been legal to sell a house and not? Revealed what, uh, what it was built with. William Wesley Peters, Wes Peters, I told you I admired so much, made a comment uh, that's documented that it was a good thing that falling water was in the countryside because there's no city in the United States that ever would have given it uh, approval. I understand that now. Yeah. Uh, I want to say also, I think this was a terrible house to live in. I wouldn't, I mean, I've never been there. But I should think it would have been an uncomfortable house. Well, they, but, because of the you know, remember, it wasn't engine. a house to live in. It was a, it was a getaway retreat. It was a, they so went they there for have, weekends, generally. So they must have had a lot of help to take care of them in this. Uh, well, in building it, and to later, uh, quite a bit of the labor when they built it were his employees from Coffin's department store. 
Uh, maybe the unions, you know, would go out and do what they're doing with Walgreens now. <laughs> no. I was just wondering about the erosion that was predicted. Whatever, how did they ever overcome it? It hasn't eroded. It's, it's, it's not, would you agree you're just there? I mean, that's, it's, it's not eroded. That was a very, you know, engineers can over-engineer and over-analyze. And I think that's what the Knowles people did. And they also, they were asked by EJ to look at that as critically as they could. And so they, at Talius and West, uh, we had made a, a kitchen that he had designed uh, for the whole fellowship and the dining room next to it. And because we were feeding uh, 40 or 50 people three meals a day, uh, we had to have the Arizona Department of Health come out and look at everything and tell us what we had to fix. Well, every year when they send a person out there, it was another rookie. And that rookie would have to find something. That his predecessor or her predecessor thought was just fine. It was frustrating. But they had to show that they knew something as, as inspectors. So, you know, this door has too much of a gap, or right? maybe a rattlesnake will get in at night. Which they did. <laughs> yeah. Would it be possible for you to explain something about the water source for falling water and the septic system for falling water? I can't tell you anything about the uh, waste water. Waste water. I don't know. You know, I never had wit to ask that question. <laughs> the water itself is is bare run. It's a natural stream. Did you ask any question like that when you were there? I'm not as smart as Mary. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. When the, uh, in spring flood, did the, did the house take a beating from, no. from boulders or? or it, no, it did not. Huh? Why, why didn't it? I can't answer that. But no, it didn't. It's, it's, in 1991, uh, they sent an engineering firm to, because of the, these, Those things had started to sag. In fact, they almost, they started to sag almost as soon as the building was up. And they were concerned about it. In 91, they sent an engineering firm out and checked it all over and said no. Or I guess it was 89. Said it's going to be all right. And they sent another one out there in the early 90s. The building's owned by the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy. Edgar Kaufman Jr. gave it to them in 1963. In 2001, now with computer analysis, and some ways to look into the structure. They said, no way. And they came out and propped it. And they spent over $900,000 putting reinforcing, uh, reinforcement steel in those uh, cantilevers. And it's been about four years now that it's been, is that my timing right on that? They were just there, they, they know more than I do. Uh, but it's about that length that that project's over and these things are, are going to be there for a long time. There's a theory, I'll come to you, um, this is Bill, he's, he's the, probably the single best humanist in the United States. He got his uh, tenure at Yale before he had his PhD done from Cam Cambridge. Uh, he wrote the book, uh, Changes on the Land. He's an environmental historian. Kevin. 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 No, not McKibben. No. No, I hired this guy, I helped hire him in, in Wisconsin. Uh, it'll come to me. His father was dean of arts and sciences there, or letters and sciences, they call him. He wrote the introduction to the MoMA exhibit, I think about 19... 91 or 92, on Frank Lloyd Wright. It was a great exhibit. And as a, wonderful uh, catalog, and he wrote the introduction to it. He had, he had an insight in there that I hadn't heard before and I really haven't heard since, but uh, 
that Wright was in Chicago in 19, excuse me, 1893 with the Columbian uh, Exposition there. And uh, he worked for one of the architects and put it up. And it was not supposed to last. You know, there was a, the white city was beautiful. But it got destroyed, deliberately. And Cronin is his name, thank you. Bill Cronin uh, speculated that Wright didn't think that structures should have to last forever. They were there, they had a function. The function, uh, he, one of his things that's on a lot of his stuff is form follows function. You know what the function is and the form follows it. But he thought that it was okay if they didn't last forever. Is that true or not? You know, I don't really know. But a guy that's got a hell of a lot smarter than I am speculated on that. So. Yes? I think maybe you just answered my question when you said that uh, Wright didn't necessarily, didn't necessarily believe that buildings had to endure. But my question uh, had to do with your reference to that, uh, I guess it was a restoration or renovation project that cost $900,000. And maybe more. Yeah. I'm not at all well informed about Wright, but I, years ago I happened to see a documentary about that, that restoration. Uh, I, I assume it was on public television, I don't remember. Um, but I was very shocked to hear that a building, you know, not that old. 70 years. Yeah, required such, you know, an incredibly expensive renovation project. I mean, what, what is it that was wrong with it? Didn't have enough. Didn't have enough structural steel in it. Okay. Oh, right. okay. Pretty, you know, this was not unusual for Wright. Uh, his favorite building of mine in his modern period is the uh, Johnson Wax building. I just love that building. And it was all had these clear story windows all the way around it. And he made them out of, of uh, glass tubing. They had never been used, and they leaked like a son of a gun. <laughs> And they tried caulking them, all kinds of things. And finally, they've just taken them out and done something that looks the same, but it uh, doesn't have holes in it. He was always out ahead, uh, it seemed to me. Not always, but frequently out ahead on the use of materials. I mean, he was using plywood to make furniture long before anybody thought much thought of that. Structurally, obviously, he seemed to know what he was doing. You mentioned the story of the pillars and yeah. the Johnson Wax Pillars. On that one, he sure did. And, and I always I tell us in West, the, uh, the first place he built for himself and Mrs. Wright uh, called the Sun Cottage. And uh, since his second daughter moved into it at one point, we call it the Son-in-Law College Cottage, because she had about five of them, um, husbands. Uh, the windows were beveled out, but they all, all had a, an overhanging roof over them. And in the wintertime, with the sun low, sun came in, directly in, and it provided warmth. About mid-April, the sun would reach a point and it would never come directly into that. Now, I know architects now use CADs, uh, computer-assisted drawing, and they've got programs on there, and they can say this window at 7.32 in the morning on November 15th, you know, what's the light going to be? And it shows you. He did this intuitively. Now that, that particular one always impressed me. I, I could talk about these kinds of things for a long time, but somebody else is going to want to take the wheel here. A rather mundane question, but uh, I believe. Here, here comes Noah. No, no, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. So, <laughs> uh, you mentioned that there is no door on the entry to... Well, there is a door. Oh, okay. But, but there's, there's nothing that you associate okay. with a formal okay. door. Because I, I envisioned uh, open space and knowing no, no, that no, no. their winters are no more temperate than ours, I wondered how they heated the building. Uh, while, there's build, while the building was going, Frank Lloyd Wright was trying to have Kaufman send them a winter supply of coal to Wisconsin to heat Talies. <laughs> They were a pair. I, you know, you were just there. That entryway, 
you know, that really doesn't have a formal door. It's a, Inconspicuous. Inconspicuous. Good word. Thank you. How, how was it heated? How was it heated? I, I, well, they had fireplaces in every room, but that wasn't the, the heat. Uh, it, it was radiant heating. But what was the source? Well, they had to have a boiler to boil hot water to run the, through the pipes. Coal? I don't know. You know, this is one of the really things I'm enjoying. Are there questions here that I'm going to go, go find out for my own curiosity? <laughs> It'd be too late for your curiosity. But, but those are those are really good questions. Well, we live in Vermont. It's cold in the winter. It's cold there too. Well, one thing about Wright's houses, I mean, fireplaces were very frequent in bedrooms and uh, dining areas, living areas. I, I lived in a, a small Frank Lloyd Wright house at Talius and West. It was about a quarter of an acre into the desert. And uh, had one bedroom, uh, one bath, uh, one little kitchen, and fairly open. I had three fireplaces in it. And floor to ceiling glass around a corner. And in those days, he did the corner glass, he beveled the glass. Well, that never fully worked, so there was. Always a little space where critters could, little, little insect critters could get in and, and wind could come in there. But it was, uh, yeah. Mr. Fish. Uh, tell us a little more, if you would, about what happened, what went wrong with the foundation and what you did to uh, put it back on its feet, if you would, please. The, uh, Mrs. Wright died in the early 80s. Uh, the foundation had been set up in Mr. Wright's, with Mr. Wright's will so that all of the, his real property and other property would go to the foundation and she was head of the foundation. And uh, the architectural firm stopped having as many strong commissions. It still did all right, Talias and Architects, but it wasn't booming. And they lived well, uh, I'd say even extravagantly. And so they, they were constantly in money problems. And they weren't able to take care of the structures very well, both in Wisconsin and in Arizona. That was a problem. Uh, and they had started, after her lifetime, they had started literally to quietly sell drawings to finance themselves. And uh, that's not only bad form, it's, it violates the law. There's a reason why you have a 501c3, you're protecting property that's in the public interest and you don't sell that off. They sold a George O'Keefe painting for about $5 million. It was being run by members of the fellowship uh, who sat on a board of trustees. There were one or two outside trustees I got to know the place because what I was doing in Wisconsin, running a state agency, everybody there thought Taliesin was important that it ought to be saved because it was really in trouble. 1,600 acres of building from every decade of his life from the 1880s to his death in 1959. It's an extraordinary place. And uh, so I was uh, out in uh, the Mississippi River to sign a bill with the governor when Tommy Thompson was governor. And we're flying back and I said, Tommy, we're gonna do something about Taliesin. What? He grew up in Elroy about 60 miles away. He couldn't have spelled it if you spotted him in the first seven letters. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you know, I told him what it was. This is the most important set of structures in the state. And uh, well, what do we do? I said, well, I think what we have, it's, we, we don't own it. Uh, the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation does. I think what I've got to do is see if, if you'll appoint a commission, I'll see if I get them to buy in. And so he said, who do you want on it? I said, just let me get them to buy it in first. So I went to Arizona and they agreed. Came back and we started a commission with uh, Sam Johnson and Herb Cole, you <coughs> see, chairs although they didn't do any of the work. And then we had Wes Peters and um, uh, 
another person from the state on it. And the three of us wrote the report. And basically, the report said that the state of Wisconsin should invest in Taliesin if the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation would give the public a right to come, come to it in perpetuity. And they agreed to that. And we set up a separate corporation called Taliesin Preservation, Inc. And I was the non-paid president of that. And in the process, I got to understand, uh, meet the fellowship, really get to know them. Hired a Vermont architect, Bob Burley, to be the architect at Taliesin. He came out and spent three years there. He's in Waitsfield, Robert A. Burley and Associates. He's not practicing anymore. And I could tell that they were in trouble when their two lead men on the, on the board of trustees, one from the inside, Dick Carney, had lung cancer, and the one on the outside had bone cancer. And I didn't see anything behind them. And I'm going to close on this one. And uh, I, kept, I lived on the lake in Madison, right across from Monona Terrace and the Capitol. Beautiful, really gorgeous place to live. And I could tell when they were building one on the terrace, when seven in the morning here, thud, could thud. They were driving piles into the lake for this thing. Uh, and I kept a, uh, a mahogany Chris Graf there. And I got the insect guy, Dick Carney, to come out. And I loaded in, he liked scotch. And Carol, my wife, drinking vodka. And of course, I had a gin martini. <laughs> and I had enough so we could reload if we needed to. And we went out on a beautiful July night with some waves, but not much, and cruised and went through the river that connects two of the lakes, and there's a lock there, and cruised around. And I started to talk with him about Taliesin and what I saw coming, and I told him, I said, I'll come run the place for you if you can keep it totally quiet for six months, because I've got legislation I've got to run. If those people in the state capitol know that I'm leaving, you know, I'm a lame duck. And they kept their word, and I went there, and uh, I had, first year I was there, first time they balanced a budget in 30 years. Not much, and, but it wasn't fake, it was real. And then started to make them money, and I was making a half a million, three quarters of a million a year, and that's how I was beginning to build endowment, and we were beginning to uh, restore these structures. Also, the School of Architecture was pretty good, but it needed accreditation at both the master's and the, and the bachelor's level, and we accomplished that uh, while I was there. That was a language I could speak after my years of education. And um, also got personnel stuff you know, straightened out, handbooks, got people paid equitably with each other. Uh, those are the kinds of things. Got into a fight with the conservancy, uh, presumably, an architect owns their drawings, not the client. And they were doing stuff with the presentation drawing. And uh, I wanted a piece of that action. And we got into, I, I lost. <laughs> but we also started the Frank Lloyd Wright collection, or it had been started. I moved, uh, had about 600 shopkeeping units, SKUs, uh, in the stores. Tiffany, China. The furniture is now made in Vermont. It used to be made in, in Japan. Uh, lighting, jewelry, shawls, uh, lamps. I guess that's lighting. And I mean, neckties. Of course, they wouldn't sell anymore. <laughs> I haven't been in public without a necktie so long. Uh, and uh, so we were making money from that. I, probably netting you know, somewhere in the neighborhood. When I left in 2002, our budget was about $7 million. Uh, we were pulling in about 700000 on that. And the biggest money maker for us was uh, the tourism. And the bookstore selling all these products and books uh, that, that were there. Uh, in, the, in the high season in Arizona, there was a tour going off every half hour with 30 or 40 people on it. And we added special tours, and a desert tour. And one tour you could come, you could actually sit in the dining room and have beverage, um, not adult beverage, <laughs> and things like that. 
I'm going to hang it up. I've got to drive back to Essex, New York tonight. And the ferry does not run. Thank you very much. You're very generous. Thank you so much.